Cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, Nina here. So we are going to be doing a live Q&A all about blogging, AI, SEO, anything you guys would like to chat about. So um, feel free to post any questions in the chat, anything that you'd like to know about, I am happy to answer. We got um, a bunch of questions on Facebook as well, so I'm also going to be answering them there. I'm just going to go double check that I did this properly because I'm never sure. Yes, it seems to be working. Okay, cool. Ah, oh no, there we go. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, so I'm gonna start with some questions that we had in uh, the Facebook group, but if you guys have any questions here, just pop them in the chat and I will get to them as we go. Um, anything is allowed, so ask whatever you'd like to. Um, Theo may or may not pop up. He is sleeping on the floor right now and he's very tired today, I don't know why. But yeah, we are doing this to celebrate hitting 2,000 people in my free Facebook group. If you're not in it, I highly recommend you join it. I'm going to post um, a link in the chat that you guys can check out. Now, we also hit a number of other goals this week, which was really cool. I hit 8,000 uh, followers, I guess, subscribers, I don't know what you call it, um, on Twitter. I hit 2,000 people on Instagram, and I hit 2,500 people on YouTube. So we're celebrating a lot of things here, which is really cool. So yeah, any questions, pop them in the chat, but I'm gonna start with the Facebook group um, since I don't see any yet in our chat here. Oh, I think I need to set it actually to live chat. There we go. Did I do that right? I hope so. <laughs> Post any questions there. Okay, so uh, da, 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 to start, so I have multiple zero to hero keywords that I've written on and they aren't ranking higher, but I don't know what else to check. Neuron Writer is what I will often run it through to make sure it has the extra keywords and the posts are better than all the other ones, as far as I can tell. What else should, be, should I be looking at when zero to hero word isn't working? So zero to hero keyword, if you don't know, is um, a strategy that, the kind of a name I came up with for zero volume keywords. I jump between names for them, but they're all kind of the same idea. Um, now, zero to hero keywords still work post HCU. Everyone always asks me that. They do still work, so don't worry about that. Um, but really like neuron writer or something like that are not good for those keywords. I actually don't recommend using a content optimizer if you are um, using a zero volume keyword because content optimizers look at the top 10 results. And the nature of a zero volume keyword is that the top 10 results were bad for it. So we actually don't want to base ourselves around those. That's not helpful. That's not going to benefit anybody. So instead, what we want to do is we want to actually look at what our users would need to know about the topic. So my recommendation is stop using Neuron Writer for those. Um, a content optimizer is only good when the top 10 are good, because that's where it's getting its data. But then you just want to look at like what's most beneficial for your user, write more around the topic, internal link them, and like zero volume keywords sometimes still need backlinks, especially for a beginner site that is going to be important to remember. They need less often, sometimes they need none, which is really nice, but especially when you're a beginner, you might need some backlinks. So ultimately, if something isn't ranking, the first thing I check is, does it satisfy user experience and user intent? Is it like good for the user? And then the second thing is going to be, um, is it like built around the topic enough that Google understands I know the topic? And then the third thing, backlinks. I typically put backlinks last, even though like they almost always move the needle because they take work. And I'm lazy. I don't want to have to like build backlinks if I don't need to, even though I like them. Hey, everybody. So we've got some more people logging in. So hi, everybody. I'm answering some questions from the Facebook group right now until we have some in the chat. But feel free to ask any questions in the chat, too. This is a Q&A. So I will be answering anything and everything. And hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, I think Kate said that. Yeah. Hi, Kate. Theo is you can like just see him asleep right here. He's figured out exactly where the heater will like blow on him. And I just took his heated blanket away. So it's cuddled up there now. <laughs> okay, next question from Olivia. When creating silo pages, is it a problem to list the same article more than once if it falls under two headers? So for example, Cuba articles under both Latin America and Caribbean headers on a destination silo. So that kind of depends. Um, for, it doesn't it doesn't hurt it to be honest but it's more about the having Latin America and Caribbean header I think that actually hurts it because here's the thing we as travel bloggers know more about geography than most people do 
And even we are not perfect. I often call myself out for this because this is a really embarrassing mistake. I didn't know where Mexico was. Like, and I'd been there. Like, as a kid, we used to go there all the time. Like, that's like was my mom's favorite place to go when I was growing up. But I never considered like what designation it was in. I would have said, yeah, it's in um, probably in Latin America, probably in the Caribbean, maybe South America. I don't really know because continents are not typically the focus and like delineations like that of a geography class, even if it's good. And a lot of them are really bad. Mine was definitely not good. So what we want to do instead for a destinations page is like segment it by country. That's going to be so much better for you. So I would say that doesn't hurt you to like list it under two things, but you kind of shouldn't have to because it like really you should segment it in a way where it's very clear where that thing is. And I do think listing it per country makes a lot more sense for your user. Hi, how's it going? It's going well. Thank you. Um, oh, and then she also asked, um, or sorry, they, I, I'm trying to be better about gendering people and please call me out on it because I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm trying to be better. Also wondering if it's appropriate to link to related digital products on silo pages or just articles. Totally okay to link to digital products. I do actually recommend it, but put some of the like links first. Don't start with a digital product because people are going to think it's a sales page. So I would put like, let's say if you're a destinations page, you list I don't know, five countries, I'd put it after country number one or number two, as long as it's relevant in that spot. Um, I wouldn't put it like front and center. You want to have something for people to see first. Otherwise, like, I don't know, it just seems a bit too adsy and people, especially on mobile, if that picture is like the whole screen, it's not going to, it's going to like dissuade them. They're going to go away. Um, Rihanna, Rihanna, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. <laughs> um, this might be a dumb question. There are no dumb questions. My rule the only dumb questions are the questions that no one asks, because if you don't ask them, I can't help you. And you only know what you know. So like it is OK if something is unfamiliar to you. So I always give that diatribe because I think it's so important. And I know I say it a lot, but like we also by saying that you're calling yourself dumb and none of you are dumb. So don't do that. OK, but what's the best way to find out what keywords a post is ranking for and in what position? So to find your rankings, I'm actually writing a post right now about like how often to do that. And spoiler alert, don't do it every day. It's not worth it. Um, but to find out what you're ranking for, you'll go to Google Search Console. So Google Analytics is where you're going to see, like that's G4, where you're going to see, okay, how many people are coming to my site total? Um, what pages are they going to? And that's going to be from like any traffic source. But Google Search Console is where you're going to see the specific rankings per post or page or whatever type of thing it is for image. Literally, image links sometimes rank depending on your site. Um, those are going to be in Google Search Console. So that's where you're going to see the keyword data. So to figure out um, what a specific post is ranking for, you go to Google Search Console and then you're going to go to like, you know, where it has like the graph on the page. There's like a little read more kind of, it doesn't say that it says something else. I never remember what it says. I think it says report in the top corner. You'll click that and it's going to open that page where it has all the keywords at the bottom, but those are for everything, right? So at the top, you'll see it says three months. Beside that, there's like a little plus icon and that's where you can add filters. So you're going to filter it per post. And by doing that, you're going to do it per URL. Um, so I just grab like the last little bit. So for example, if the post was things to do in Rome, if I have a bunch of posts on Rome, I'm not going to put Rome. I'm going to put things hyphen to hyphen do hyphen in hyphen Rome. If that's the URL, I don't put like, I don't just copy it because the problem is sometimes HTTPS, sometimes HTTP, sometimes www dot, like it varies. And I don't, care enough to like fix that. So I'll just grab that last little bit. And I think that's important. Um, so that would be what I then put in and then you'll filter it and you'll only see the keywords that that specific post is ranking for. And then make sure you have where there's like those four numbers at the top of Google search console, there's clicks, impressions, click through rate, and then position, make sure position is turned on and then it'll list the position. 
Now, if none of what I just said made sense because you're not very familiar with Google Search Console, if you go on my YouTube channel, there is a Google Search Console walkthrough that will take you through how to see all of this and like it'll make a lot more sense then. Okay, we got some questions in the chat. Uh, so I'm sorry, it like gives YouTube names. So I'm gonna refer to you guys that way because I don't know <laughs> what else to call you. If you want me to call you something else, just put like it's and then your name and then I can call you that. Um, so tools region, I want to increase brand searches through ads, but I confuse what kind of ads I should run. I have no idea, I don't do ads. Not good at it, not my thing. I only do organic SEO. That's all I know how to do. Um, I tried Facebook ads and I hated them. So other people are really good at them. Other people are good at Google ads. If you want to learn about Facebook ads, Niche Site Lady has been tweeting about it a bit lately. Um, and she recently recommended someone who I can't remember their name off the top of my head, but you should check her recent tweets because she referenced this person. And then I know Fat Stacks, he talks about using Google ads to rank for like keywords and then get back. It's a whole thing, like get backlinks. It's a whole thing I don't understand. Um, but yeah, I don't do ads. So I'm sorry, but I don't want to help with that because I, I would ruin you. I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, Sunanda, I think, says, hey, Nina, could you please suggest SEO blogging strategy using only free tools? Not dumb, first of all. No one's dumb. Um, I don't like free tools. Free tools are bad, unfortunately. This is the hard thing. Like, I would recommend Key Search. It is $132 a year. If you use, I have a code KSDISC. Um, if you go on my site, my Key Search review has it. Then it'll be $132 a year or it's $17 a month. So what I recommend doing is um, if you open up Key Search for a month, and just use it for one month and then turn it off for three months or so. I wouldn't go too long in between using it because keywords will get out of date and the data will go off. So I wouldn't do it like one month of a year, but I would say like once every three months or six months and then come back to it. So then you're paying $17 and I don't know what it's $17, but you would reduce it 20% with the code I just said. And I don't know enough mental math to do that mentally for you, but I think it would be like 15 ish maybe. And I think that's a pretty reasonable amount to pay to get a bunch of data for it. Um, the problem with free tools is that they're free and they're usually not even worth that. So I did try for like six months with Uber Suggest, the free key search and key search right now, they're doing a free trial thing. And I don't remember off the top of my head how long it is. It might be seven days. It might be two weeks. I'm not sure, but you can check that. Um, but I tried Uber Suggest. I tried the Key search used to have like a free like five search a day thing. Even then it's not as informative as the actual tool. Um, Google Trends will give you trend data, but that's not necessarily keyword data. You don't see difficulty. So yeah, I would recommend um, focus more on like an inexpensive tool that you're gonna use efficiently. And if you want like a tutorial on how to use it um, on my YouTube channel where we are now, I have um, an in-depth, keyword key search walkthrough that will really take you through how to find all of the different like ways to find keywords there but um yeah free tools are just not really where it's at unfortunately um and i do not recommend them because i do think like you could try to piece it together you're gonna waste so much time though so for like 15 dollars once every three months i think that's a pretty good deal personally but feel free to disagree with me um the, the, I think I got that one. Okay, sorry, I like started scrolling, so I'm trying to find where I stopped. Um, okay, William, I am considering a pivot to travel. Why? HCU hurt me bad on a site I've been trying to build for three years. No AI, qualified writers, no manual pen penalty. How do you travel without travel? Okay, this is something I don't understand. Can, and please explain, and I'm not going to critique you specifically. I'm critiquing like generally things. People who want to have a travel blog who don't want to travel. Now, you might want to travel or you might have traveled. That's fine. That's good. Um, and you can write a travel blog about where you live. But I do not think it is valuable to create a travel blog if you never intend to travel or to keep traveling. So in fact, like my main site, I keep toying with selling it because I don't really live abroad anymore. So it feels weird to run a site about that thing if I'm not actively doing it. Now I'm still like an expert in that niche and I know a lot about doing it and I keep up to date on information. It's just a lot harder with a dog now. So like I can't jump 
between countries every two months like I used to, especially with like needing to plan calls in advance and stuff. Um, you don't need to know my problems. It's fine. But yeah, I wouldn't start a travel blog if you don't have some expertise in travel or if it's not about a place that like you do know to some extent or can experience. So I know Digital Nomad Wannabe has a blog called Dive Into Malaysia, I think it's called. And she's not from Malaysia. She goes there like every, I don't know, I think twice a year or something like that. She doesn't go there that often, but she's been there enough. And when she goes, she does like super tours of Malaysia, trying to get all of the information on it. That's fine. And so she's doing like kind of fact finding missions almost when she goes. So that's a great way to do it. You can also do it about your hometown or your home state or somewhere that you've been many times before. And this might like help finance you to go back there. That also works. I do not recommend for any niche, starting a niche about something that you do not know about and have personal experience with and that you don't intend to do. So I got a message like I think a year ago, maybe even longer than that now, of someone who had started like a blender blog, like, I don't know, Nutribullet or something, and they didn't even own a Nutribullet. And they had no intention of buying a Nutribullet. And I was like, why did you start this site? It just made no sense to me. Because even back then, I was like, how do you know that thing well enough to talk about it? Um, I don't like doing that. I think it's very important to have hands-on experience, even if not with that specific thing, like knowing the overarching niche. So to have a travel blog without travel, you either need to have previously traveled or you need to like have it be local to you. That would be my recommendation. Um, or pick a place you really want to go to and then go there and do some fact finding stuff before you start it. That would be the other thing. Um, and I don't mean to critique you in particular, William. I just mean like, I, I keep getting this on Twitter. I get so many DMs of people being like, I want to get rich and travel, but I never want to travel. And that's, exactly how you fail with a travel blog. So just be careful with that. Now for the HCU, your other site, I've seen a lot of niches where it just like the rules changed. So I have a friend with like a gluten-free blog and then suddenly gluten-free became like medical for a minute and they would only rank like WebMD style sites, which was really weird. Um, I've seen like fashion went more e-commerce. So sometimes like the niche search results just change, unfortunately, and it may not have been like a helpful issue. It might've been that Google decided all these searches are something different now. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's on you for the other site, but for the travel thing, I would just make sure you're finding some way of expertise in there that an experience that you actually have in that thing. Um, Laura asks, how are your sites impacted by the latest Google updates and what's your focus for 2024? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so latest Google updates, I'm assuming you're referring like back to the HCU because there were a number of them in like November as well. And then December um, had like, people are calling it like the hidden New Year's update. And I don't really know if there was one or not. Google has said that they're stopping. Um, so it's the tangent, but they said that the review updates, they're no longer gonna tell us about. So I do think that those were kind of ongoing rolling out. But yeah, um, three of my sites are significantly up. And the other one, I just like, I went kind of crazy and I audited a hundred posts all in a six week period. So it is like stagnant, not down really, not up though. Um, but that happens when you massively change a bunch of posts. So overall, I would say, yeah, doing well. My focus is, my focus was supposed to be doing less. That has already not happened. And I already have a million things that's happening this month and next. So yeah, my main focus is just great content. That's kind of always what I focus on is trying to get um, my full silos built out properly in a way that helps my audience and builds community. I would like to like figure out one other thing. I've just always been mad that I don't get Pinterest. It's like it doesn't feel like it's that complicated, but I've never been able to crack it. So that's something I just kind of want to do because um, I just think it's interesting. It's not necessarily that I think you need to be on Pinterest, to be honest, but yeah. That's kind of my focus is just writing more and writing around content uh, like pillars rather than I was just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall last year because I was so busy. And I do think that hurt my sites um, where I was just letting writers pick willy nilly off a list. And that is not a strategy. <laughs> so be intentional, I guess, is kind of the focus. And then hopefully rest and do less. <laughs> Um, Brittany says, Hey, Nina, just hang out listening during lunch. Happy lunch. I hope you enjoy whatever you're eating. 
Uh, oh no, I just scrolled and I don't know where I went. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, Dan, Dan, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm sorry. Is duplicate content still on the radar with Google as much as years ago, especially now that AI is open to all of us? Oh yeah, Google always cares about duplicate content. They get very upset. But duplicate content is the exact same thing being restated. And I think that's what people don't understand is that it is not just, like if it's been rewritten, technically it's not duplicate content as severely. Now Google is trying to crack down on that, but I think the problem is that like AI has gotten good a lot faster than Google's algorithms have updated to accommodate it. And this is why like AI, when you're using it properly, you shouldn't just be rewriting something someone else wrote, that's not good. Um, it really needs to come down to like speeding up your own processes and ignoring other people sort of thing. So yeah, duplicate content still definitely matters. And um, Google is when they notice people are just like spinning out content like that with AI, they are manually penalizing those sites, even if the algorithm doesn't get to them first. Um, Marie says, I blog on WordPress. Do I need to put any keywords into the header information? Do I need to with tags or for SEOs, keywords in the blog title and article enough? What about headers? Do you mean like headers of the whole, the site itself? Cause like that's not something you put. So I basically, I'm gonna answer this a bit differently. The places that keywords go in a post, when you're making a blog post on WordPress, you'll click add post. And the places in there that you see are where keywords are gonna go. You do not need to like mess around with the rest of the site settings, that's not helpful. Um, especially because you don't want to put keywords in too many places or you'll keyword stuff. The places you want to have your keywords are in the URL. So your URL should just be the primary keyword essentially in your title. But if the keyword itself doesn't make sense, so if it's like things to do Rome, put in, like things to do in Rome, that's fine. Google understands, like Google uses something called semantic SEO. So they know that it's the same thing. It's kind of the same when people are debating like, um, I don't know. I think of like, what's something that has a number in it? <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example. Um, like, let's just say like, okay, the six is what people call Toronto. So either writing the number six or the typing out the word six, Google knows that's the same thing. They are very smart, so that's fine. Um, so you wanna have it in the title, in the URL, you're gonna want to include it in the post as much as makes sense. So don't keyword stuff, there's no, perfect number. There's no like every 200 or 500 words. People have always pressed me for that. And I tried to like, just come up with one. I don't like it though. It's like, it really depends on the post and the keyword. Cause if the keyword is something like how often should you check your Google analytics um, for a blog with 10,000 page views, that is weird to say a hundred times, right? Like that would sound insane. But if it's a different post where the keyword is like Roman village, you might use that a ton. So the best way to figure that out is to check your competitors. Then you're gonna also wanna include secondary keywords throughout the post. Um, and then your primary keyword, you wanna try and fit into your meta description. Um, and you also want to, in your alt text, reference it, but not necessarily use the exact keyword. So if the keyword is like Roman village, you might say like this Tuscan village or um, this village outside of Rome. Again, Google is smart. They know that's the same thing. So that's where you would put the keywords, but don't worry too much about like the keywords being splattered across the page and all these extra spaces. No, it just needs to be within that post area. And then it needs to be in a way that makes sense. Otherwise it's gonna not help the user and Google gets mad if you keyword stuff just for the sake of having the keyword. The way that you get the point across that you know what that, like what the keyword's about is the actual content. Uh, da, da, da. And then we have, Oh no, I scrolled again. Arr, scrolling is so annoying. Why can't it just stay put? Okay, um, Zishan, my website is getting 1200 clicks a day and I'm having a hard time getting email subscribers, only one in a month. That means that your freebie is not targeting them well or you're not promoting that freebie. So if you're relying on um, like a checklist or uh, just like, I don't know, just sign up for my newsletter. People don't care about that. You have to find a way to help them. And the best freebies are things that should be paid. So something that someone would pay money for, not a lot of money, 
but something that they would pay for that you're giving away for free. So like my free content audit checklist is like a 12 page technically ebook, not even a checklist. And so because of that, it's very actionable. And a lot of people sell something like that for like 50 bucks. I give it away for free. And so that means people are signing up. Now, this could also be the type of emails that you send as well. Um, a lot of people do like a roundup of deals or a roundup of jobs or something like that. You need to figure out what your audience wants from you. Because if you're just like, I just threw together this thing on Canva in five minutes and uh, it's magically going to be perfect. No, people don't care about that. And you need to also like stand out from the pack. So if everyone has that. And like in travel, everyone has a packing list. I actually don't know anyone who uses a packing list to pack. Like I just throw stuff together in a notes app when I need it. And yeah, I'm sure for like, I don't know, an Everest hike or something, then yes, I would probably need like more of a concrete packing list. But for like a week in Italy, I just need a vague idea of how much stuff to bring. And I'm not necessarily going to give my email away for that. Now, the best thing I found for getting subscribers is a quiz. And I do have a course on how I create quizzes. And like my main site gets like 1,300. I think it last month it was like 1,500 subscribers from one quiz that like I do not really promote the way I should. I don't even have it linked in all my posts. It's something that I'm working on right now is like actively promoting it. Um, maybe that's why it went up. I think I put it in a couple of posts, but yeah, it's doing very well. So I would recommend that. And you can find all my courses. Let me actually add it to the chat. Ah, keyboard, turn on. SEO.co slash everything. That's where you can find all my courses and all my freebies too. I have, I went a bit crazy last year with freebies. I think I have like 10 on there right now. Um, Brittany says, uh, continents are taught differently around the world too. Some list Oce Oceania as a continent. Yeah, exactly. Like it, you got to categorize by countries because people know countries. They don't know, um, they have no idea of different like designations of the world. Um, Mar Marie says, I love keywords every, everywhere, which is a cheap Google plugin. I didn't like that. I know some people do. I, maybe it was just me, but I was not a fan. But yeah, try it out. Um, okay. William says, sorry, I've not traveled enough. I want to travel. That's okay. If you want to travel, that makes way more sense to me. So then either pick a style that you're already doing or have done before, even that you've done with day trips and then use that or pick a place, go to the place and then start the blog. That would be my recommendation. Uh, Tori, what do you recommend is the minimum number of posts per month to see growth? I've heard eight to 12. So curious on your experience. When I did my six months to 50,000 sessions where I grew my site to Mediavine within six months, um, I did 12 posts a month, but I had an existing site with content already and I audited, I think I did, I know indexed 30 posts and deleted 50 or vice versa. I know 80 posts got wiped from Google and then 100 posts I updated in a month. So in six months, I had 100 posts plus whatever 12 times five is because one month was dedicated to actually updating. Um, that's 50 something, 60 posts, that's 60 posts. So I think I did, a, I did 60 posts in that six months, but I already had a hundred. So that was really good for growth, but those were good posts. If you are just writing to a number of posts, you're messed up. Like I, I was going to swear and I'm trying not to. So messed up was a weird word to choose, but essentially, um, you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to just write to a number. It's more about the quality of the posts and the type of keyword. And then writing around a content cluster or topic cluster is going to be more beneficial. So I, this is the thing. I don't love saying like, oh, this many posts is going to be helpful or this much or that. Like it's very, it's the classic SEO. It depends. Um, but I think it's important to say that because a lot of people on Twitter, especially will be like, oh, just hit a hundred posts and magic will happen. Like, no, <laughs> that's just not how it works. It needs to be the right type of post. My main site had 180 posts and it was getting 6,000 sessions organically. Like it's not about the number of posts, it's the quality and the strategy that matter. So I would say like, don't do more than you're actually able to handle. I can write really fast. Um, just last week I wrote 12 posts in a week because I felt like it and I missed writing. And that was just like, on like I was doing other stuff that was on the side but I'm very good at writing. Like that's my thing. So if it takes you longer, don't push yourself to do 12 posts in a month if they're not going to be good. 
that would be my recommendation. So I would cautiously recommend about two a week to like three a week sort of a thing. Um, but it depends on your abilities, your time, like what you can do realistically and making sure that the quality stays there for your user. Um, Cora Lee, both Uber suggests and Ahrefs are telling me I have no site map, but I use rank math and it says I have a site map. Yeah, so tools like Uber suggests and Ahrefs are like tertiary, they're not even secondary. Your primary is Google Search Console, which is where you should actually check if you have a site map. Um, it literally, it has on the sidebar, it'll say site map and check that there's one there. Then rank math is a secondary tool that's going to help you connect your site map. And then Ahrefs and Uber suggest are like sending bots at your site to check if it's there. And they are usually flawed. So Ahrefs, Ahrefs webmaster tools, the amount of times I get flaws or like everything doesn't exist or it's all broken. It's because they like send a bunch of bots at your site and the better your security is, the more it'll reject it. So they're not great to check all that stuff. Um, so I would check in Google Search Console and then I would trust rank math basically. Um, as long as you have data populating in your search console and when you try to index new things like or put them into Google, it registers it, your site map is there. Uh, da -da. Uh, Marcus, I have a question. If I'm correct, you are also using key search. Yep, key search is, I've actually turned off Ahrefs now. I just, I, you don't need it. It's not worth it. Um, I was using it lately, but noticed the keyword difficulty is sometimes quite different compared to SEMrush and other tools. Yeah, every tool is different. This is the thing, um, when you're comparing things like keywords to other keywords, keyword difficulty to other things, compare within the same tool. That is so important because they all have their own version of evaluating something as difficult and things like that. Even like when you consider DA with Moz versus DR with Ahrefs, they are completely different metrics. There's similarities, but they are not the same. So if I went, okay, my site has a DA of 12 and someone else was like, cool, my site has a DR of 12, they could be completely different. And so we really want to evaluate within the same thing. It's kind of like if I was comparing Canadian dollars to US dollars. They're both money, but they are very different. So that's where we want to make sure we're comparing within the same tool. That's going to be important. Um, even like when I give things to clients, when I was doing keyword research, I usually do it with Ahrefs because like I had it, <laughs> I needed to use it up. Um, and I do think it's still good for like agency level stuff, but for a user, just use key search. When I do agency stuff, I'll turn it back on for the month. Um, if I need to, to be honest, I, you could mostly just <laughs> use key search, but yeah, I would have to tell them, I'm like, this volume is from Ahrefs. It is very different than the volume that Key Search is going to give you because they all have their own estimates. Okay, uh, arr, scrolled again. Oh no. Uh, I thought I saw something. There we go. Okay. Uh, Sunanda says, could you just share the SEO strategy for blogging online that is useful for blogging journey? we would be here for two hours. It's, uh, unfortunately, like this is the thing. It's hard to give the full strategy. You really have to take one of my courses where I can go in depth because just telling you like, just find easy keywords. That's not enough. Just know your audience. That's not enough. The keyword strategy is holistic about absolutely everything. So you don't want, um, yeah, you don't want someone who's just going to give you a five minute answer. It'll be wrong. So I would recommend go to shinosseo.co slash everything. I linked it in the chat and that's where you'll find all my courses. So I would recommend um, if you're just beginning and just looking for traffic, get my six months to 50K masterclass. We're doing a re-recording of it live in two weeks. There's an email going out about that next week. Um, it'll be on January 20th. So you guys get exclusive information. Um, or if you want to know about monetizing and everything to do with your site, then I would go with the SEO roadmap. Um, Marie says, what about subtitles? Subtitles are on videos. Do you, do you mean on this video? I don't know how to turn those on. I, I barely set this up today, to be honest. I was two minutes late because I couldn't get it to connect to Zoom, so I just went live within YouTube. So I don't, I don't know how to turn subtitles on for this, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, looking forward to following your build in public with the Ottawa site. Thank you. I'm hoping it actually makes me work on it. So far, it has not. So I need to get on that. Um, 
Okay, what do you do if the keyword is too difficult or not when tools have different numbers? Oh, you figure out the difficulty level within the tool and then you target it there. So with key search, like this is the thing, every tool is going to determine easy versus difficult, but they often base that on uh, backlinks and the DA of the site. They do not consider topical authority. So no matter what the tool is, you have to figure out what the difficulty is. And then you have to like figure out, or like, you, sorry, you have to figure out how authoritative your site is and then the difficulty level you can compete with. So it's just like you would figure out what DA level you can compete with. And I have a calculator on She Knows SEO to help you figure that out. I'll link it once I finish talking. I can't, I'm very bad at multitasking. If I have to speak, I will, I'll just start saying what I'm doing. Um, but for key search, you typically want to target like blue or green keyword or blue or green difficulty. The thing is, it will very much depend on your niche, on your authority, as to if it's actually easy for you. So like my friend Jessie of Jessie on a Journey has an insanely high DA. So for her, something that's red in her niche might actually be easy, where for me, I'm not in her niche and I don't have the same DA as her, although I'm catching up one day, maybe. Um, it, that would actually be hard for me. So there is a lot more that goes into it than just looking at the color there. That's kind of the problem with some stuff like this. It's the same thing with a, like an SEO plugin, whether or not it's free actually, like Rank Math or Yoast or All In SEO or All In One SEO, whatever it's called. The problem with them is they're very simplistic in their view of what like what a difficulty is or if you've optimized enough. Even like Rank IQ or Surfer SEO or Neuron Writer, any of those content optimizers, do not rely on any one tool. Your brain is the best tool you have. So use your brain, use a strategy, and those tools are just meant to help that strategy. We are never going to a tool and being like, well, Key Search told me to do it, so it must be true. No, <laughs> it's not. You have to use a strategy to interpret that data. Otherwise, the data means nothing. So yeah, that's kind of my long-winded answer. And just give me a quick sec, and I'm going to grab her. I hate having, I, I swear to God, I'm going to throw this wireless keyboard out the window because I hate how it takes like a second to turn on and I am the most impatient person in the world. Calculator. There we go. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to recommend a keyboard to me, I would much appreciate it because this keyboard is driving me nuts. Okay. This is the calculators. So they're, the first one is a DA calculator that will tell you when you put in your DA, what DA you can compete with. If you haven't used this page before, I recommend checking it out because I also have keyword traffic calculators. Um, the amount of page views you'll roughly get from your whole SEO strategy from a bunch of keywords, affiliate income calculator, RPM calculator, and sponsored link calculators all on there. It's one of my favorite pages on my site and I don't talk about it enough, but I need to. Okay, uh, Mariah says, hi, Nina, I have a new blog that I'm focusing on solo female travel, living abroad, etc. And then also my hometown. Number one issue, that is too many things. Those are all different things. And those are all different people who would want those things. Those are three sites. Um, number two, uh, sorry, the, the, my number one, not your number one, um, having trouble connecting slash linking to linking the two. Yeah, because they're different sites. Any advice are both topics too much? Yes. So I didn't even finish the question, sorry. The problem is we need to know who we're talking to. And someone who wants solo female travel, living abroad, and like your specific hometown, probably different people. It could overlap, but it's very, very hard. Now, if you want to expand to do all three of those things, I recommend picking one first, writing about 50 posts on it, and then move on to the next one. That, like you need to have that type of topical authority first, and you need the trust of those people first. We trust a lot of people now, like, I don't know, if Kylie Jenner came out with, I don't know, I guess she cooks sometimes, maybe if she came out with like a, a line of aprons, people might buy it. But at first, if she did, people would be like, why are you releasing aprons? We don't trust you on that. They trust her on other things, I think. I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to think of somebody. Usually I use Gordon Ramsay as my example, but I don't know enough about cooking. To, <laughs> I always pick people I don't know about. But yeah, it's... um. We trust them more afterwards to expand, but to start, you want to be really hyper-focused and niched before you move on to extra things. So I would recommend picking one. And I caution everyone against solo female travel. It's what I did to begin with. And it is so hard because solo travel is not a niche. Solo female travel is not enough of a niche. There are too many people doing it. Solo female travel 
in a location, that's a niche. So that could be something. Um, I will also say a lot of people think living abroad is a good niche because I do it. If I could change things, it would not have been the niche I chose. It is so hard to monetize. So I'm cautioning you against it because it's hard and it's an uphill battle, um, but up to you. I think you've chosen two hard niches that I also started with um, and I regret it. And it's why my newer sites are not on those niches. Um, the, okay, Deanne says, what's your take on the debate that Google uses LSI, latent semantic indexing keywords? I keep seeing that Google has denied they exist. Google also denies that they care about backlinks. So I don't listen to anything Google says. Um, they, they matter and they exist, 100%. Just like um, an NLP, like natural language processing model that their, uh, their systems use, it needs some of those terms. And the thing is, those terms like should be relevant to the topic. So if you're writing about things to do in Rome and you never mention eating pizza or pasta, people are going to be like, what's happening with this post? Or if you mention going to New York and you never mention the Statue of Liberty, even if you were just saying it's overrated, people are going to be like, do you know New York? So we want to mention things that are relevant. And that does often mean that they are these LSI keywords because everyone's talking about them. But everyone's talking about them because they're relevant. So that is like, I do think they matter for sure. And I think, I don't know, I don't trust what nonsense Google tells us <laughs> to be honest. Okay, Justin says, have you seen the debate between Dr. Mike and Dr. Gun Grundy, G Gundry? I don't know. They talk about the blue zone study. I've never heard about any of these. And they just crapped on veganism. I'm not a vegan. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Um, uh, could you please suggest SEO blogging strategy using only free keywords tools? I think we already had that question. Um, okay. Do you create conversion events in G4 to track affiliate conversions? No, I use Affiliate to track my affiliates. Unfortunately, they've turned off new accounts right now, which is so annoying. They said they're going to turn them back on eventually. I don't have an, a date, um, but I use them to like syndicate all of my stuff. And then in there, I can see how things are converting. I can look per post, per link. Um, the best option otherwise, honestly, is Link Whisper. Most of us already have it. And there you can see every individual link and then the clicks it gets. So I use that as like a backup, um, but I really love Affiliate and I hope that they open up again soon because it's ridiculous that they don't. How do you use keyword synonyms? You mean secondary keywords? I, I think you mean like it, like things to do in Rome versus what to do in Rome. Um, if it makes sense, I'll mention it if it's natural. If not, I just skip it and then I see how well I can rank for it. And then later I'll add it in if I'm not ranking quite high enough. Um, but also they need to have the same intent. Many of them do. But remember with semantic SEO, Google does know a lot more than we give it credit for, for um, how similar the keywords are between them. Like it, it would be able to know that those are the same thing usually, which is why we don't always need to say it again. And I think people who say it again, I have a few friends actually who were like, okay, we need to mention every single one. Like if there's 700 um, keywords on that are suggested for that keyword, I'm gonna write on, put all of them in there. The problem is now you have 700 words, probably more than that, because they're usually multi words that aren't necessarily about the topic. And it looks like keyword stuffing because to Google, those all mean the same thing. So don't go overboard with it, use it naturally. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the Facebook group for a second and I'll come back to this again. So please keep putting your questions. Um, I have like saved where we are. I'm gonna actually just highlight it in case. Oh no, I just scrolled again. Oh no. Oh. There we go, okay, I'm gonna highlight where we are, but I'll come back to these, but I just wanna answer some from the Facebook group too that people submitted before. Um, okay. Can you go over why you would choose to no index a blog post? So no indexing a blog post is telling Google, don't look at this. So anything that's not good for Google, we no index basically. So that would be anything that is too difficult, anything that doesn't have a keyword, um, something that you wrote for Pinterest. So if it gets Pinterest traffic or Instagram traffic or any other form of traffic, but it's not gonna rank for Google, then we no index it. So that would be why basically. Um, I have a, an Instagram video I just posted yesterday about that. Okay, I know there are many creator programs out there through organizations like Meta, LinkedIn. Are there any that you've ever personally joined or been accepted to? No, I don't bother with them. Um, can you please talk? And also I'm Canadian, so remember that. 
Canadians, we can't get into a lot of stuff. So I don't join most things because they're like, no Canadians. Um, can you please talk about how you leverage your blog for partnerships without visual content, like photo deliverables, videos, et cetera, like solely using your blog if it is something you should have something you've done or had brands want to sponsor a blog post yet yeah, brands don't care about perfect images or videos to be honest like you can do deliverables of like an iphone picture or videos um i am i've got something cool coming for you guys in february on this where i'm partnering with somebody who has done uh, she literally she took me on a press trip with her to help me get back into it now i actually kind of like them which is annoying because like again i have no time why do i want to do everything i need to clone myself um but essentially, you just need to have a community. So to me, I leveraged the community. And that's where like more of what I was doing last year was sponsored links on posts, like not even a dedicated blog post, just a sponsored link. Um, I've done newsletter campaigns. So like the thing is, take what you have and take the metrics that you have, take the best metrics that you have and then use that. That's the main thing is present the metrics in a way that you can then tell a good story to that brand um, where you can position yourself as something helpful to them. That would be my tip. But yeah, we've got something cool coming for you guys next month on it. Should pingbacks always be on? I just turn them off because they're annoying. Like Google still registers it. It's just that then you get a weird notification. So I don't know. I, I don't use them. Uh, da, da, would it be possible for a DA15 site to change its domain name without having to start from zero again? You would have to start from zero, but you're starting from like a zero. It, so it'd be like if you ran a marathon and then you took a year off and then you ran another one, like you'd still be starting from a better point, especially if you redirect everything over. The problem is you're going to lose the DA for a while and there are no guarantees that it will 100% come back. Now, a DA15 would be, I've been able to grow a site to a DA15 within like four months. So, and I wasn't doing it super intensively. You could do that a lot faster if you're, um, if you're doing it more actively and with the redirections, you could probably build it pretty quickly. Um, but you would, for a couple months, you would feel it for sure. So I wouldn't unless you really, really, really need to. So the problem is a lot of people think that your like blog domain name matters so much. It needs to be like about that city or about that thing. I don't think exact match domains matter that much. Like I think they're helpful, but they're not the be all and end all. And if you have the keyword in the domain, great. My main travel blog does not say travel. It does not say my style. It doesn't say it's a Canadian like colloquialism for travel. So that's not like, actually helpful to anybody to know about my niche, but I've branded it. So it's more about the branding of it. And personally, I, I just wouldn't give myself more work um, unless your site name is something like travel with kids. And now you're moving to a travel without kids kind of niche. I, I would just work more on content. I think that's the thing that matters the most. Um, but yeah, I've also not done it. So can't speak to it fully. Um, I've seen people that do bounce back from it. And I would, if you're going to change it, do it sooner rather than later, because just like changing anything, changing your theme, changing um, your host, changing whatever, make the change as soon as possible. It will be easier. So yeah. Uh, if I want to focus on one social media channel for my travel blog, which one may be the best to help grow my blog and brand for 2024 and why? That's going to depend on your audience. So I don't know. Because like if your audience is over 50, Facebook is really good. But obviously for SEO and like blogging, a lot of people are still on Facebook. So that still works. Now, certain niches, Twitter is better. Certain niches, TikTok. Certain niches, Pinterest. It really is niche dependent. So the biggest thing is going to be um, what your niche is. And I don't see an answer about what your niche is here or a comment about it. So I have no idea. And it's going to take testing. So like first find out where your people already are and then try to be there. Um, but like ultimately you can kind of make the space. So you can just like create a space and then see if people come to it. And if they don't move to the next one. Um, what should we use for social media title for our blog posts? Okay. I just want to like preface this guys. I don't know social media. <laughs> like I am not good at it. I know SEO and I know blogging and any success I've had on socials is a complete accident. So I uh, she's like, uh, sorry, this person says, should they be the same as a blog title? Is there anything that includes a keyword? Okay. I don't know. I think like socials are kind of more like discover titles. Sometimes again, depends on your audience. I just, I just do stuff <laughs> um, and then see what happens. So it's going to depend. 
And I think ultimately having a community, that's the great thing about for my success with SEO is I have a community who can forgive me for not knowing what I'm doing. And so then they kind of don't care about the title because they know the quality I produce. So yeah, no idea. Sorry. Okay. I'm curious to know, someone has had their blog for five plus years. Would you say old posts lose traffic with time? Yes. Any post that is over 18 months old is now a liability if you are not updating it. So this is the thing. Everyone's like, publish a million posts. I want to have like 100 posts a year or something. That's great. And like totally fine as long as you have a plan to update them. So people like um, Spencer Haas of Niche Pursuits, he did like 1,200 posts last year with a bunch of writers. Obviously, he has a team. But he also, I asked him, he has dedicated staff who are just updating content. And he can afford to do that because like he makes like three thousand dollars a day on ads because he has so many posts now um, and so much traffic with a good strategy and brand recognition so people like like the brand and trust it but yeah it's uh any post that is over i would even say a year old you need to be checking on and sometimes they can last for a while but if you're not updating them making sure it's still relevant making little changes and like seo changes over time seo is not a hundred percent passive it's just more passive than social media. Um, you're still going to need to update and fix it. Otherwise, yeah, it's a depreciating asset that can drag down your whole site. I've uh, been recently wondering about analytics. I know Google Analytics can be a little problematic, but I know I'd like to get into a media network if those may be preferred to other analytics. Yes, use G4. It's I don't understand why people don't get G4, I guess. Like, it's not that different from universal analytics if you guys don't like g4 i do have um a youtube video about how to like use g4 and kind of turn it into universal analytics but also there is a free let me grab the link there's a free looker data studio that you guys can use that will make your okay i need to remember who the last person was there we go um that will make your G4 look like universal analytics. So it's a little bit easier to understand, but yeah, ad networks are only accepting Google analytics. So you have to use it. And I don't see the point in using anything else. Like it's not that hard to figure out how to use the basics of it. If you want to learn it in more details, um, beast analytics has like a really great course on it, but that's going to be more if you're tracking affiliate conversions and e-commerce conversions and a bunch of other stuff to start, like just to see page views, just use Google analytics G4, all you need. Okay, I need to drink something. Throat's so dry. Okay, uh, could you cover affiliate links where the product is no longer there? Like what do we do about a post, what to wear in XYZ? For fashion terms, they turn over pretty often and they leave an error when people click through. Yeah, update it. That's the best thing to do. Tra uh, fashion is hard because things do go out of stock so quickly. So you just need to stay on top of it. That's where having something like Affiliate's really good where it will tell you when links are broken and when like the product returns an error. Um, unfortunately, the best thing to do is just to update it. Now I am not in the fashion niche, so I don't know all of those systems. My friend Tay has a blog in it and I think she uses um, like to know it or reward style. I don't know if those are different or the same, but I don't know if that maybe suggests other things. I'm not sure. But yeah, you just, you really need to stay on top of updating that stuff. And same goes for like Viator links or anything. A lot of them will tell us like Viator, if you go in, it'll be like, you have links going to inactive tours. Great. Go fix it. <laughs> link to something else. That is really important. If something is a dead link, um, it is unhelpful to your user. And then it makes your content unhelpful to them overall. We don't want that. So update. That's basically the thing to do. This is why, again, regular updates of your content are so important. And for something like fashion, you may even want to consider like having a VA whose job it is to go in and change that out every month or something. Okay. I saw some posts in this group recently talking about their rank page rankings dropping. I'm wondering where you find that info. Is there a plugin? Okay. Earlier I talked about using Google search console to find those. That's where you would see it. And then you would just where at the top, it says like three months, you would compare to the last three months and then you can see the position change. Um, da -da. what should we do if you have blog posts that are no longer related to your niche, but have backlinks to them? If you built the backlink, like you got a guest post, email the person to change it to something else, um, if possible. Well, for, okay, number one, if it ranks in the top 10, leave it. It's a good ranking. Who cares? Um, number two, if it doesn't rank, no index it. If it gets traffic from anywhere else, I would just keep it that way. But if it uh, doesn't get traffic, 
and it's not relevant to your niche, but it has backlinks. If those backlinks can be changed, usually guest posts, they're okay. If you ask to change the backlink to something else, then I would change it. If not, if it's from something like the BBC or like a big news source, I would just leave it no indexed um, because sometimes redirecting the post will, number one, it's not great practice if it goes to like from the post to your homepage from this giant site, not as trustworthy um, for the user. But also sometimes the redirect will trigger a broken link on like a checker. And if they see it go somewhere else, they might remove it. So then I would just leave it no indexed. And then otherwise I would just change it and then put it direct links to a new post and delete it. I'd love to know how you go about prioritizing keywords and knowing what to write first. Do you go with the highest potential search volume or what's more relevant to your user? A bit of both more relevant to my user and easiest. Those are my methods. I'm not sure if you normally answer these types of questions, but would you be willing to share how many blogs you have and the different buckets of where your income comes from? Like what percentage is from sale of your class, what percentage are from ads, affiliate links, YouTube, et cetera. Uh, I have posts on She Knows SEO breaking all that down. I don't like saying it off the top of my head because I don't remember the specifics and I never want to miss cite something. Um, so I would go check She Knows SEO because I do have income reports on there that do break it down by my sites and their general niche um, and the specific income of how I make income off of all of them. So I would go look there. Uh, da, da, da. I'd like to know more about your keyword research method, especially regards to how to content. For example, how do you find keywords for your mocktail site? Um, so. Basically, I just use key search. Oh, no, I clicked out of it. Ah, what did I do? <laughs> I keep clicking things. Oh, no. Oh, goodness. Where was it? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh, there we go. Okay. I'd like to know more about your keyword research method. Sorry, guys. I am chaos with all this stuff. Uh, especially with regards to how-to content. For example, how did you find keywords for your mocktail site? So for that one, I did niche research first, and then I just stumbled upon a lot of them that way. But I do competitor analysis. Um, I do have a post on She Knows SEO talking about how I do that. Find people on Mediavine in my niche, mine them for keywords, write those keywords. Um, then I will do zero volume keyword research, another post on She Knows SEO, and I use key search for all of this. Um, I will also just look for easy keywords in my topic cluster on key search. And then overall, the strategy of actually like writing them, like I just said, user uh, user research, and then and like kind of like what makes sense. Like I posted about this on Facebook. What is time? Oh God, when did I do that? I don't know. I think in December, maybe November. I don't know. But I posted about like the way that I do, I plan content is I plan it like I would plan a trip. So I'm going to talk about like the beginning of like, where should I go? Okay, here's when you should go there. Here are the tips of things to do. And I think about all the things around how someone would plan a trip to that place. And I'm going to plan content around all of it. And then I'm going to find keywords to match it to some extent. Sometimes the keyword informs it. Sometimes the user research informs it. Sometimes it's just logical. Like, okay, if I have a site on traveling with a baby, I need to have a post that's like how to travel with a baby just a general one, even though I may never rank for it, I need that post for my audience. So yeah, those are my methods. If you want to know more about my different keyword research methods, you can check out the six months to 50k masterclass, which is all about how I took my site that was failing for four years and turned it into a site that got into Mediavine in six months. Um, I also have the SEO roadmap where like, so that one's just about traffic. The SEO roadmap is more about like actually growing a blogging business where I talk about affiliate links, ad revenue, um, digital products, email lists. Basically, you become a mini Nina. I talk about everything I know about um, consumer research, audience research, creating a community and creating a site that is going to last you a long time um, and continue to bring you income. So if you guys want to check that out, I'll drop the link again in the chat. I'll be careful I don't mess this up with the order of things. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna do one more from the Facebook group and then I'll bounce back to the chat here. A lot of you guys now, there's so many questions. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a random and specific technical question. I'm also in the middle of Googling at the moment. Do you happen to know how to switch an Elementor blog post over to, Word, or to Gutenberg? Yes, so you're gonna have to unfortunately set up a staging site and then you're gonna literally just have to go into like the view of your site and copy and paste that post from the normal view, not the editor into Gutenberg blocks. Elementor is a short code editor, so you can't just like convert it over easily. You have to copy and paste the text. It is 
very annoying, but you want to do it as soon as possible. Otherwise, you're going to do more of it later with more posts. Um, I'm going to do one more because I see a niche site lady, and I think those are interesting. Over on Twitter, niche site lady has been talking about how much traffic she has from getting on her travel blog from Facebook. Uh, I know this isn't you, but could you talk a minute about getting a Facebook follower? Oh, okay. No, I can't answer that because I don't do it. So you need to, you'll need to ask her. I, I don't pay for Facebook likes or anything. Not a thing I do. So you'll have to speak to her. Okay. Back to YouTube chat. Oh my God. So many questions. <laughs> I told myself I would do an hour, but we're still here. So I'll keep going. Um, Hi, Nina. Would it be a smart move to add a homemaking category to my blog with two existing categories, Catholic living and Catholic pilgrimage destinations? First of all, I don't 100% know what homemaking is. I think that's like keeping a house. I don't know. I, I would be a very bad housewife. I'm not sure. So if it's that, I don't know how it connects. So the thing is, I was talking about this before too with that whoever said the solo female travel and living abroad in hometown, um, apologies, I'm not going to scroll back to find names because I'm going to mess all this up. I have a very tenuous grasp on the chat as it is. So I would look to your user first and I would fill one pillar at a time. If a pillar is not growing fast enough or well enough, um, you probably haven't filled it enough yet. And then also remember to get backlinks. It's something everyone skips for some reason. Please, for the love of God, guys, if you do anything this month, go write a couple guest posts, please. <laughs> like audit your content, write guest posts. Those are so important. Um, so yeah, I, I don't love adding more categories. I actually love removing categories and then writing around that category to death. I did not think I was going to have a site that was still about living abroad at this point. I thought I would write like 20 posts and move on, but there are still questions I need to answer and you need to answer all those questions before you move on. So if you have conquered Catholic pilgrimage, uh, Catholic pilgrimage destinations and Catholic living, then move on. But I'm going to bet you haven't conquered them yet and you haven't finished them. So finish it first. Okay. Uh, do you have a blog post word count target range? I tend to write really long posts and I'm trying to decide if they should be shorter. Yeah. So I have a post on Chino's SEO actually talking about that and like how long a blog post should be. Um, but essentially it should be as long as it needs to be. So look at the top 10 to give you a range, but um, don't add words for the sake of words. And sometimes a lot of us try to like combine multiple articles into one post and they don't need to be, they can be separate articles. So shorter tends to do better post helpful content update, but only if like, like my, the key search review I just did that, like, it, I think I only told the roadmap this, but it went off on Google discover and got like, I don't know, 3,500 page views in two days. I haven't checked what it did yesterday yet. So may have done more yesterday. Um, but it did really well. It's 4,500 words and it's already doing well on Google search as well. Um, so Sometimes the like longer ones are okay if it's beneficial, but if you're just like adding on like, okay, if it's things to do in Rome and then you're adding on where to stay and you're adding on where to eat and you're adding on tips for visiting, those are separate posts. So then move them to separate posts. My mouth is so dry. Oh my God. My mom's going to get so mad at me. She's always like, have a cup. No, I don't want to wash cups. <laughs> um, how do you write so many blog posts so quickly? AI. For me, well, okay, this is the thing. For me, I'm a very fast writer. Um, I actually, oh no, where is it? So I wrote a post on this because usually my, my two answers are AI or I'm just really fast, which is true, but I've also been able to get really fast. So I wrote an article um, talking about how long it takes to write a blog post and then tips for writing it faster. There you go. What's the strategy for ranking over Yelp for restaurant slash food guides? You won't always rank above them. It's not always bad to rank below something though, guys. Don't forget that. So for example, in travel, there are many keywords where I will rank beneath the tourism board. Tourism boards aren't that helpful. So the click-through rate for the number one spot on average is highest and it, it, it will be higher. But the second spot isn't always that different. It depends on the keyword. So like post helpful content update, um, anything beneath Reddit, the click through rates higher because users actually don't want Reddit as much as Google wants Reddit. Um, so that's important to know. Then yeah, for Yelp and things like that, 
comes down to the quality of the content. Um, but also remember Yelp has a lot of backlinks because many of us will link to Yelp for an example or a review or something. And so that gives them more clout. So over time, you can outrank them. I've outranked TripAdvisor many times. It just comes down to the quality of the content and the intent as Google determines it. But also if you can't outrank them and you're just below them, not the end of the world, you'll still do pretty well. Oh no, Google Search Console won't fetch your site map. Okay, then um, you're gonna need to set up another one essentially. So what I would do is go through the rank math uh, setup again, just like from scratch. My mom just texted me. I thought I genuinely thought she was gonna like she was watching this and was gonna yell at me for drinking out of the bottle. <laughs> She's in my Facebook group and she will often like message me about stuff. I'm like, mom, you don't know what's happening. <laughs> okay. Oh no, I moved again. Uh, do you recommend an everything page for SEO or is that page a good idea based on marketing? Okay. With an everything page, do you mean my she knows seo.co slash everything? Because that is like a list of my courses. So that's more for user experience of like it's a, a roundup of all of the offers I have. Um, if you're not selling things, you don't need that. Now, for a silo style everything page, like if you go to she knows seo.co slash SEO guide or things like travel blog guide or travel blogging and then AI guide, those are my silo pages. Those are really good for SEO. The everything page, I've never even checked its rankings, to be honest. Like, I it didn't matter to me. I, th I think it might be indexed. I'm not actually sure. Let's check. Are you indexed? Yeah, it's indexed. Okay, so I've indexed that. Um, I don't know its rankings. I would have to check after. But yeah, I, I think it's good. That That's a user experience thing for sales um, and for ease of me showing everyone everything I have. Like you can see, I think I have like 10 freebies there, all my courses on everything. And I'm working right now on creating like an FAQ section of common questions. So there's one there right now, which is like, what's the difference between the 50, oh my God, <coughs> losing my voice. What's the difference between the 50K masterclass and the SEO roadmap? You'll find that there. So like I'm starting to add those. So it's more of like a hub for the user, less about SEO but the silo pages proper, those are for SEO and those are very, very helpful. I was talking about those yesterday with Lizzie Goddard of um, Elizabeth Goddard who run, who run, who ran the Christmas party I was in that did that big bundle. And I, she was like, what is that? Like, why do you have those for all your posts? And I was like, they're the same as your everything page, but for Google. And she was like, oh my God, I need to make those. So that was really cool. Like I was, Lizzie is like my course creation mentor. I followed her for so many years. And so like, it was just cool to co-host something with her. Um, it was only for Christmas party members. So if you didn't hear about it, you weren't a member, unfortunately. Um, but also she was like, yeah, the fact that she learned something from me was really, really cool. I just love that stuff. Okay. What suggestions do you have for connecting blogs and YouTube channels and growing them both at the same time? Don't know. This YouTube channel has mostly been luck. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. The amount of emails I get every day telling me I don't know what I'm doing and that they could help me fix it. Um, I'm not going to do that because I tried like getting proper thumbnails and stuff, but I hated waiting to get them. I just want to publish when I want to. So I have no idea. Mostly this is the thing. The only success I've had on social media and I count YouTube in that, even though I know people say that YouTube and Pinterest aren't socials, um, is because I have a good community that I've helped. Everything stems from that. It is, I don't know what I'm doing on Twitter. I don't know what I'm doing on Facebook. I don't know what I'm doing. on. I definitely don't know what I'm doing on Instagram. Um, that one TikTok video I had go viral of Theo in glasses. Honestly, I got really high one night and then put him in glasses. And then I woke up and it was doing very well. It was ridiculous. Um, YouTube, we're just here <laughs> and it works. So a lot of it comes down to like having good quality content, having a community and then doing things properly probably helps that, especially at the beginning. I don't, I just do stuff when I feel like it. And then I've been very fortunate to trip my way into success, but I cannot in good conscious conscience help you with social media because I don't know what I'm doing. So I would recommend finding people who do. Um, Theo, the marketer on Twitter is quite good at YouTube. So I've been learning from him a fair bit. Um, he is also, pardon me, they, I don't know how they identify. Um, they have also given me tips on some like photography editing that was really nice for how to fix some photos of Theo because I do want to eventually learn how to take photos. Um, but yeah, they're cool. I like them. Okay. Eva, I found a 
Website that ranks in the top 10 for a keyword, but never specifically state that keyword in the article. How do they rank for that keyword? Uh, probably semantic SEO, um, where they probably referenced the topic or the keyword somehow, or Google had nobody else to rank. So it does just depend there. Um, sometimes as well, if they didn't write the specific keyword, it doesn't mean that they aren't targeting it. It might be targeted via anchor text for internal links or backlinks. So that could be something could be their topical authority, but typically if, if their site is not like, I don't know, the New York Times where it, or Forbes where they rank for anything, whatever they feel like, um, with like a blog, like let's say it's like a DA30, then likely they've either optimized in like kind of a more hidden way, um, or it was like they optimized for a different version of that keyword, like we were talking about before with synonym keywords, um, but it could also just be technically you stumbled upon a zero volume keyword where if they don't answer the question or they're not targeting it fully, Google just didn't have anything else. So that would be what's happening there. My blog is quite old. It started in 2009 and I updated all the posts in 2018. And I haven't since then. If I update them again, how much do I need to change? It'll depend on the post, whatever needs updating. So it does, you don't have to necessarily, um, like, like there's not a specific amount. It just needs to be, the most relevant for right now. So you probably need to update any information that's changed. Um, you probably need to update any like old, like if you keyword stuffed before, get rid of that back in 2009, even 2018, that was more doable. So I would filter that out a bit. Um, but ultimately like there is no, th there's no perfect amount for anything. So I hope that's clear for you guys. Like there's no perfect word count. There's no perfect um, like exact amount anything needs to be. There's no exact number of anything in SEO. And that's kind of why I love it is because it does vary so much. So it means like every post you write, every keyword you write is different. And for my ADHD brain, I love that. I love that every single time it is different and that every few months we have to adapt a little bit to something that changes. Typically not a huge adaptation, but the helpful content update was obviously. But yeah, that's why I love it. So I don't mean to be vague. I just genuinely mean it does depend on the post. If it's a post, it's like, um, I don't know, when was the Alamo? Well, that doesn't change, but maybe the way you talk about it changes a little bit. If we've learned something new, if you referenced the exact date being this long ago, then you would update that. But if something is like, um, I don't know, if you talked about something like, let's say like the COVID protocol somewhere, you need to fix that. Or if a certain restaurant closed down, you need to remove that from the list and either put a new one in or change the list around. So that would be the kind of changes you would need and it would really vary based on the post. Okay, I'm gonna try to get faster because I do wanna get through all of these. Um, okay, I wanna ask link building. Do you think it will be redundant if I did guest posts and list everything on my page with the link to them? I did a link to everything on my page. Oh, do you mean like having like a press page where you would like, I have a press page on She Knows SEO you can look at. The way I do it is um, I would not link, do not link to a blog post that links to you. Not worth it. That creates a reciprocal link and it undoes any of the benefit it gave you. Um, also, to be honest, your audience kind of doesn't care <laughs> about where you've guest posted. They care about what's on your site. Um, you could promoted on social media. What I will sometimes do is I'll put the name of the site I guess posted on. And if I really think the article matters, I'll put the title of the article, but I will not link to it. Then my audience are smart enough. They can type it into Google and go find it. Um, you can no follow it, but Google sometimes passes authority through a no follow link by accident. And with those, I don't want to risk it. So I just don't link them. I don't think it's worth it, but ultimately your audience doesn't care that much to be honest. Like it, it sounds bad, but they don't. Um, and if you're doing it more for like a work with me style thing of being like, look where I've written for, just putting the name of the site is enough. And then they can do the work of double checking it. Most of them won't double check it, to be honest. Does that mean if I write an SEO optimized article that specifically states the keyword multiple times in the right places, it is more likely to rank for this keyword? Not if the content's not helpful. So First go with content and the topic and like hitting the user intent and then keywords are secondary and there are never guarantees. Google does not care about you as an individual. In fact, sometimes it feels like they actively hate us as an individual to be honest. So um, it, yeah, it, there are no guarantees. You're gonna do better if you target the keyword with the intent more so 
and if you mention it at least once. But it's going to depend on the post. Uh, da -da -da. That advice drives me crazy too. People say a similar thing. Okay, I don't know what I said to be honest. This is I'm already, I'm like I'm like half an hour back basically in these. Oh God. Um, I live in Arizona, which is a huge tourist destination, but I love to travel to other parts of the U.S. Would it work to have both those regions and oh both parts of the U.S. and Europe? Would it work to have both those regions on the same blog, or should they be split? What connects them? That's going to be the thing. Figure out a connection and then maybe they could be on the same blog. And the connection cannot just be, I went to both of them. There needs to be a travel style or a reason that your audience would do both. So I don't, I don't really recommend people have multiple blogs. Honestly, I hate having multiple blogs. If I could, I would just have one. Uh, the problem is for me, the one that I would want to have the most that I have the most fun with right now is She Knows SEO. But for the sake of She Knows SEO, I need other sites because first of all, it's not great if you teach about SEO and you only rank for SEO stuff. It's kind of weird. Um, but also I need travel blog stuff to talk about. So yeah, I kind of set myself up a little bit weirdly, um, but yeah, not a fan. <laughs> so um, I would say pick one and stick with it as best you can. But I do like a travel style for that because then you can have more leeway to write about multiple places. Uh, do you have a Mac, Apple keyboard, and mouse are so easy? That's what I have. I hate it. This is a, my little Apple thing. I hate it. I hate it so much. I, I want a wired keyboard. I know that's old school, but I do. Um, what's the best way to pick categories to, if you already have 100 posts with a mixture? Oh, that means you need to niche down. So niche comes first, categories follow. That's my advice. Um, I know it's kind of vague, but it's going to, I don't know what niche you're in. I'm sorry. So it's going to come from that. And you need to find a way to group that, that content. If there's no grouping it, you need to create a niche that would then have groups and then get rid of what doesn't fit. Uh, you think there are still opportunities for building niche sites in 2024? Yes, 100%. Um, I have a bilingual site where I post English and translate every article into my own language. Do you think this may hurt my website somehow? I don't know enough about bilingual sites. Um, so there's typically you need like the N Lang, I think it's called or something. I don't remember what's called, but there's like a, a way to do SEO for that. That'll like create the two versions of your site and the different content. The problem is Google can, they didn't used to be able to do this, but now they can identify duplicate content when it's just been translated. So you need to make sure it's clear that you did that translation. Um, I don't don't remember off the top of my head what it's called though, but it's a special type of like coding you do on your site. So I would look into that. Um, but unfortunately I don't know more about it. I'm sorry. How do you work on content pillars? Can you give some tips? Do you short, do you do shorter posts and one long one that combines it all? Okay. So a silo page is a silo page. And then it just, that's where you just put all the links to the topics in that pillar. Pillars and silos to me are the same thing. Um, they're basically just a grouping of content under a theme, essentially. So like, let's say for She Knows SEO, SEO is one of those content silos. So is AI, so is travel blog. And you'll see them in the menu bar. When you go to them, there's a page that just rounds up all the content there. And then there are topic clusters underneath that where it's like, okay, keywords, backlinks, internal linking, that's all part of SEO. So I break it out that way. With travel, it's commonly a destination page where you would then put like Aruba, Cancun, wherever. Clearly, I want to be somewhere warm right now. It's very cold here. Um, so that would be then how you would build those out. Now, I don't, I'm just trying to understand what you mean by work on content pillars. Do you do shorter posts and one long post? It's just content that relates to each other. So like if you go on She Knows SEO right now, I have like five or six posts about internal linking. That That is the content silo. It it's that it's writing on the same content essentially um, and the same topic. So it's just about writing that. Yeah, basically. Uh, are you planning on attending WITS and or offering a mentor session? I was turned down from attending WITS this year. I applied and I didn't get it. Um, I'm speaking at TBEX and affiliate gathering so far. Those are the only two places. Um, affiliate gathering is in May, beginning of May, I think in York in the UK and TBEX is in Puerto Rico in July. So I'm speaking there, but no, Wit said no, which was sad, but I think they focus more on social media. Uh, da -da. 
after the HTU, how important is it to keep the same name across all platforms? I don't think it's that important. And I don't know that it's changed since HTU, but also again, I, I think my new rule is I'm not advising on social media because I don't know. <laughs> um, da, da, da. Everyone hates on G4. I just don't think it's that different. Like, I don't know. I think it's, if you click around it for a day, it's not that bad, honestly. It's not great, but it's not that bad. Uh, da, da, da. Thinking about writing an FAQ page for a specific destination. Any thoughts on that? I don't know what you mean by an FAQ page, so I'm not sure. Da, da, da. Thoughts on acquiring competitor sites that are for sale. I have a competitor that has listed their site and considering buying it to absorb it into my brand and use it as backlink strategy. Yeah, hreflang, that's it. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, I knew it was something, but I had no idea what. Um, I don't, I've never done it. I mean, a lot of people do it. Um, it depends, I guess, on the effectiveness of, or pardon me, the quality of their backlinks. Um, you will probably lose some of the effectiveness of it. Like if you connect two sites because of the redirects and stuff, it's not as strong when you have a redirect from a backlink and things like that. Um, but I've never done it. That's not something I, I just don't, I don't know. I don't think any of those things that necessarily speed it up are super helpful. Um, I would rather just build myself essentially, but up to you. Um, I also have never bought anything for a site. Like I've never bought sites, so I don't know. Um, I'm very nervous about it because I have so many friends who got burnt buying things that then the listing agent was bad or the place that it was listed. Um, I've had like many friends buy things and then half the stuff was in a different language or um, like after the sale, it found out there was a bunch of spammy stuff. So not, I don't, I, yeah, I, I'm very cautious with that stuff. I'm a very conservative person with those sorts of things with buying stuff. Um, I hate spending money, so that would be it. So uh, you would probably want to speak to someone else who's a bit more experienced in that. Uh, creating a travel blog based in SD as a local, I think San Diego, not sure. I'm still trying to figure out a specific niche, but do I need it to be specific? So I'm talking about sites, restaurants, spas, hikes. Well, then San Diego is your niche then. So then you're set. Like that location can be a niche. It doesn't need to be like people with kids in San Diego. You just need something that like all the content can fall under an umbrella and that umbrella needs to fit all that content. So if it's all going to be about San Diego, then you're good. And I'm guessing SD means San Diego. I'm not sure. Can we get away with shorter word posts? So what's the minimum? I already talked about word count. So I would go back and rewatch for that bit. Uh, is that a bad thing? I don't know what that's referring to. Oh, no. Uh oh, sorry, I've lost track. <laughs> um, Marie asked, is that a bad thing? And I'm not sure what you're referring to, referring to, Marie, I'm sorry. If you can answer that for me, that's good. I'm just gonna finish off with some Facebook ones now because we still have more over there. Okay, you mentioned tracking finances daily and I'd love to learn more about how you do it. Uh, yeah, I just posted a YouTube video of exactly how I make my spreadsheet and what I track. So go watch that YouTube video. Uh, would it be smart to add a new category to a travel blog that is not blog related, but is also a pain point for the audience? Homemaking. Oh, is this, I think that might've been the question we had earlier. If you finish the other things, start new categories. If you haven't, do not start new categories. Thoughts on link swapping. Would you recommend it? If yes, how often? How effective is it compared to collabs and guest posts? Most effective guest posts, massively way down here, collab posts, link swaps way down here. So do guest posts. That That's my recommendation. They are going to give you the best return on investment massively. Link swaps, Google doesn't like. Collab posts, you're like mixed in with a bunch of other people. Um, I used to do more link swaps. I do not do any now really. Like that's not true. I, did, I tried a couple recently to double check that they didn't do much. They didn't do much. So do guest posts so much better. Um, also better to like connect with other people in the niche. Um, and yeah, just like get to know other people. Some of these are the same question as we've had here. So I'm just trying to like filter out. I think people came to both. Uh, okay. Just started a new blog and I'm moving content over from my old blog. I'm getting myself all confused about the best way to organize categories. The new blog is about things to do in an area. So I just do categories about the places, states slash boroughs, or do I split them up into types of places? 
it'll depend on what you think your audience needs the most, to be honest. Like this is, if you just tell me like things to do in an area, I don't know if that means a city. I don't know if that means a country and it'll vary depending on that. If it's a country, I would do locations. If it's within a city, I would do the style of stuff. So like the categories of things to do essentially. So then I would probably do the latter. Yeah. About finding data on backlinks. I've done one guest post with five backlinks, and then I've received two backlinks from businesses who have linked to a post where I featured them. Key search only shows that I have one backlink. Don't check there. <laughs> Honestly, I, first of all, I don't check backlinks. As long as I know it's on their site, that's all I care about. It is up on their site. It is working. I'm good. I move on. Um, do not bog yourself down checking stuff. So checking your analytics every day, checking your Google search console every day. Don't check things every day that don't move the needle. So, and, and a lot of those things too, if you check them every day, they're going to bring you down if they're not benefiting you. So I find the thing that benefits me every day is checking my income because I can kind of control that. So I can look and see, okay, I didn't make money yesterday. Well, now I know I need to focus on more affiliate posts or I made a bunch of money because I ran that sale. I'm going to do some more stuff like that. So we want to look at that because it helps our money mindset and it keeps us kind of accessing money. But with like page views and stuff, we can't change that. So I can't go in one day and be like, oh, my page views dropped. I'm going to will it into existence. Unless you are actively auditing content and making changes that will improve it, don't look at that stuff. Same for backlinks. I don't really care what key search says my backlinks are. I don't even look at them in Google Search Console. I don't care. I built the backlink. I know it's on their site. I've seen it. I'm good to go. I'm done. So yeah, I, the discrepancy is because they're a tertiary system checking things. And so they're not going to be perfect. And even Google Search Console won't check things and be perfect. And it can take, so Google will typically take 90 days to like really have the effects of a link kick in. I've even had it take like close to six months. That's okay. It takes time. Um, but those tools are extra on top of the algorithm. And I only care about the algorithm. I don't care what the tools say. Can you talk about the Google content update and core update from October 23 blah, and how to change strategy based on it? Talked about this a lot and I do have an HCU video. I recommend checking that out. The Those core ones didn't really change things significantly, to be honest. Um, it kind of undid some of the worst stuff from the HCU, but I made that HCU video post those for a reason. I like waited to see what happened. So go watch my HCU video to see my new strategies with SEO. Um, but to get the most up-to-date and the most in-depth of my strategies, go to sheknowsseo.co slash everything and get the SEO roadmap. The SEO roadmap is where I share the most detail, the most up-to-date stuff, where I offer the most help and support. And it is really where you're going to see exactly what I'm doing and having success with. It's also where I share what's not working because I think that's equally as important. Um, it's where I share my case studies and my tests. I'm running like eight different ones right now. And I don't share those publicly, sometimes ever. Sometimes I wait six months to share them after the six months of actually testing it. So the roadmap gets the most up-to-date, most helpful information. I really, really recommend checking it out there. Uh, da, da, da. I really don't like reading long blog posts, but I noticed lots of blogs have long posts. What would you say is the minimum amount of words you can get away with and still rank? I already answered that beforehand. So it, it's, there's no minimums or maximums. It's re like relative to the keyword. So go rewatch earlier in this. Um, how's Theo? He's so sleepy today. I don't know what it is. He's just like, he's passed out on the floor right now. Hi, baby bug. That's also a blanket featuring his face. <laughs> so it's all pictures of his head. He is just chilling. I don't know. He's very tired today. Uh, what's HCU? Helpful content update. There is a video that explains it in more detail. Uh, we wanted to qualify for Mediavine for our LGBT travel blog by June, only at 3,000-ish sessions per month right now going up fast. Is such a timeline feasible? What is your number one tip for achieving it? Could be, could not be. It depends on what you're like, sorry, trying to figure out how to explain this properly. It depends on how much you can invest into a strategy for this. And I don't mean necessarily monetarily, but I mean time-wise too. So it depends on the specific keywords that you're going to focus on and the locations you're talking about. If you're going to 
try to get into Mediavine in June, but the primary place you talk about is in the low season in June and no one searches it, that's not going to help you. Um, so you want to make sure that you are writing towards keywords that peak at the time that you want to get into Mediavine. So like, I don't know, what's a destination that peaks in summer? Well, it needs to peak kind of a month or two after because you want to make sure people are searching for it. So look in key search at the trend and figure out there. Um, but then it's also going to depend on like how many posts you can write, how many backlinks you can get. Get backlinks as soon as possible. Audit the existing content. And really, like you're basically doing what I did in my six months of 50K masterclass, which we're doing another live re-recording of it on June or June, January 20th. Um, so if you guys want to join that, the price will also rise after I re-record it. It's currently 147 and it's going up to 297. So if you want to get in on that early, you can do so. Um, the link is on chinosseo.co slash everything, but that would have my exact six month model to do this. Um, but ultimately it's going to depend on your capability for how much output you can put out essentially. Cause yeah, if you can only handle like one post a month, it, then it's not feasible. Okay, so I think we've hit everybody at this point. Um, thank you guys so much for joining. My throat is so dry. I need to go up some water and get something to eat. So I really appreciate everyone joining me. Um, and thank you guys so much for supporting me and uh, following me on all the socials. Again, I don't know what I'm doing on socials. The only reason they're doing half decently is because you guys are here and we have such a lovely community. Um, if you are not already in my free Facebook group, I do recommend joining us there at SEO for Travel Bloggers. All bloggers are welcome, honestly. One day I'll change the name to make that clearer, but um, yeah, everyone is welcome there. That's where I share probably the most stuff, to be honest. Um, and yeah, you can find me all over the place at Nina Clapperton or at She Knows SEO. You can definitely find me here. There's tons of stuff on this YouTube channel. Um, and just remember that I am not uh, trying to overwhelm you guys. I just try to be as helpful as possible. So feel free to ignore the stuff I put out that is not currently relevant to you. <laughs> um, don't go too much into like too many things. Um, but if you want to get the most learning from me, I am not currently open for coaching. I am taking some time for my mental health. So the only way you can really get solid coaching from me is in the SEO roadmap, which is shenosseo.co slash SEO hyphen roadmap, which is where I teach all my strategies for monetizing and growing. Now, if you want my beginner course, which is just on getting some traffic, that is the six months to 50K sessions masterclass. That is just how I got 50,000 sessions in six months. It is not about monetizing. Um, it is just about gaining traffic and it is my beginner course, but that's also available and the price will be, oh my God. <coughs> Sorry, my throat is so dry right now. Talking is hard for me, honestly. My body hates talking. Um, but that is $147 and you can find it at shenosseo.co slash everything. I don't remember the exact URL for it, um, but we will be doing a live re-recording of it uh, to update it kind of, it's been a year and a half, so it needed an update. I update everything within 18 months. Um, but yeah, you can find that there and we're going to be recording it on January 20th at I think 9 or 9.30 a.m. PST, but we're sending out email about that. Don't worry. Um, and then the recording is going to become the new course. So yeah, thank you guys so much for joining and I hope you have a lovely day. I hope January is already treating people better than 2023 treated some people. Um, I also hope that it is not as dreary and rainy and cold as it is currently. Um, I moved to the West coast of Canada thinking it would be a little bit warmer. It's not, it's exactly the same. So um, yeah, stay warm. If you have a puppy, give him a cuddle for me and I will see y'all soon. Bye.